and God wants us to trust him. And when we do that, he does marvelous things beyond what we can think or imagine. You've read that in the Bible. Believe it. It's true. But that means we have to exceed our capabilities and our resources. So one day, God looked down. He saw a man. He said, I need a man to be a general for the Israelite army. And he said, you know, I see this guy. He's hiding over here in this wine press. And he's scared to death of the Midianites who are going to come and take over the land. And God said, he's my man. I want a scaredy cat. (laughs) I want a guy who's never been a general, who's never led anything. In fact, I'd like to have a person who is the least likely person ever to do anything important in the world. And so you know what he did? He went and found this guy. His name was Gideon. And Gideon's life story begins like this. He was the least man in the least family in the least tribe of the nation of Israel. So what does that mean? It means he's the very last person that anybody would have chosen to have done anything, just anything. (laughs) He is not qualified to take out the trash, (laughs) all right? The least man in the least family in the least tribe of the nation of Israel. And God said, he's my man, he's my choice. I'll take him. And why? Because if Gideon succeeds by his faith in God, everybody will know that it wasn't Gideon who did it, but it was God who did it. That's the testimony that God wanted to give the world, that God is in this thing, and he's allowed Gideon to be a participant with him. And God still works that way. I just love it when somebody comes up to me and says, I just can't do this. I don't have the ability to do this. I say, fantastic. Now you're ready for God to do something with you. You know, I've been working in Christian higher education all of my career, basically. And I have students that are like that all the time. They come from crazy backgrounds. I myself graduated lower third of my high school graduating class, and my high school counselor told me, well, you're not much of an academician. We better send you off to the factory someplace, get yourself a job. And so that's what I did. I mean, I, he's smarter than I was. I mean, he'd been to college. So I went and worked for R.C. Whirlpool for about six months. And I shot two screws in every automatic clothes dryer that came past me on the assembly line. <laughs> they gave us jobs according to our mental ability. And... But God wanted me there. I am convinced to this day that God wanted me doing that job. Now, somebody has to do that, and I'm glad for people who find that kind of a job fulfilling. But listen, God put me on that assembly line so that he could talk to me. Oh, there are a lot of people that talk to me, and they say some things that were not very nice, as you can well imagine. But God was speaking to me, too. In the midst of all of this din, God was also talking to me, and he was speaking to me and telling me, that, uh, hey, there's more to life, more important things for you to do than this. And all of the lessons and all the stories that I had heard from my childhood, from my parents, and we sat around the kitchen table with, in Bible studies and so on, all the Sunday school lessons, all that kind of stuff came back and just poured itself out on me. And I knew that God had something in mind for me that was way beyond my abilities. I didn't know what that was. To this day, I'm still content to walk in the mystery of God's will. And I hope you're there, too. I don't know what God's going to do with you. I'm not sure what he's going to do with me from this point forward. But I do know this, that God looks for people who don't think they can do something because those are the people through whom he can shine the best. And uh, maybe you can do a lot. But what you need to do is decide just about how much more of a lot you can do and then go on beyond that, because that's where God wants you to be, okay? So, Gideon, you remember how he called a bunch of people to be a part of the army, thousands of people came from all the tribes, and finally God said, well, you have too many people, you know. If you have so many people, people will think it is just the sheer numbers that that, that win the battle. I said, we got to have fewer people. (laughs) Now, he didn't say that to Gideon, did he? 
But we know that's what's going on because we have the benefit of looking back on history rather than living in it. So we look back, we see what's going on here. God is taking all these thousands of people and he's narrowing them down to 300 people. The battle ensues, or is about to ensue, and God says to Gideon, oh, we need to have some, uh, some arms for the army. So he gives the instruction that every person should have a water pitcher and every person a torch. I don't know much about military science, but I can tell you that that's not the way I would have done it. <laughs> it doesn't seem to me that water pitchers and torches are going to be the solution to a problem when you're facing 120,000 well-trained Midianite troops. And yet, when the dust of battle had settled, what had happened? All the Midianites were dead, and not one Israelite was lost. And so they sang. They sang praises at the end of the battle. And they sang, the battle is the Lord's. Who got the credit at the end of the day? Well, God got the credit because they knew Gideon couldn't do this. They knew the size of the army was too small to do this. So God had to be in this. And all the nations round about were fearful of the God of the Israelites. You see what impact the church can have today if it exceeds its own abilities and its own resources and puts its faith in God? People will look at the church, they will see what the church is doing, and they will only be able to explain what the church is doing in terms of the activity of God in the life of the church. And when that happens you will not be able to bar the doors to keep the people out. They'll want to be here because people want to be where God is. It's a natural instinct. It's just that they don't see God very much, you know? They don't even see God very much in the church anymore because we're just doing what we can do. Just doing what we can do. Well, we need to stop doing what we can do and start doing what God can do through us. Well, I want to tell you just one more story, and I'm going to quit. But this one's from the New Testament. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I learned it from a child. And it's the story of Jesus sending his disciples out two by two. You remember that one? Where he sends the disciples out two by two. And he says to them, now, I don't want you to take any bread for your journey. I don't want you to take any money for your journey. I don't want you to take any extra clothes for your journey. I just want you to go. Just go. You know, I never understood that. Have you ever understood that? Why he would tell them like that? Because we don't do that, do we? I mean, I came up here for just last night and today. And I packed a little suitcase about like this. You know, brought a little money with me. I didn't do what Jesus instructed his disciples to do because I've learned that I need to take a change of clothes with me, you know? But they didn't. They didn't. Well, it didn't make much sense, but we knew that Jesus, because Jesus was always teaching, wasn't he, that he was getting the disciples ready for the most important lesson of their life. So they went out. I don't know exactly how long they were gone, quite a while. They were out preaching repentance to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And they came back, and you know what? Their shoes didn't wear out, their clothes didn't wear out, and they were not hungry when they came back. Somehow they'd been taken care of. Jesus said, when you go to a particular town, why stay there? Go into a house and stay there until you're finished in that town and then move on to the next place. If any place will not receive you, well, then just go on. Just, just keep moving until somebody will provide for you. And they always had their needs taken care of. You know, I don't think they even thought about it very much. They came back to Jesus. They were tired and dusty and dirty. And he said, let's get in the boat and go to the other side of the lake over here, and you can tell me about your experiences. Well, Jesus, too, had been teaching during that period of time. And when the people heard him send the disciples in the boat across the lake, they decided that they wanted to hear more of what Jesus had to say. And so they ran from all the towns and villages round about. They ran around the lake and got there on the other side before Jesus and the disciples arrived in the boat. Jesus and the disciples begin to pull up toward the shore. They look there and they see this great crowd of people. And Jesus said to his disciples, they look to me like sheep without a shepherd. And so you know what he did? He began to teach them many things. 
That's what it says. He began to teach them many things. You strike a line underneath that word many things. And you know what? That tells me, that tells me it was a long sermon. Yeah, many things. So, you know what happened? The disciples came to Jesus in the middle of his sermon, and they said, Master, your sermon is too long. I did. Now, I know some of you have been reading the Bible for a long time, and you've not read that. <laughs> I get a little concerned when I look out in the audience when I say that, and some people say, that's right, that's right. That's right. No, you didn't read that in the Bible. Not directly, at any rate. What you read was, Master, the people are growing weary. It's the same thing. <laughs> Just said a little differently. All right? Master, the people are growing weary. You need to send them away because they need food. And they have to get food along the way going back home. And Jesus had been preparing the disciples for this moment now for several weeks. Oh, he said, hungry are they. Well, why don't you feed them? So you know what they did? They did like all good disciples will do. They had a meeting <laughs> to discuss the assignment. <laughs> they assembled their committee. And uh, you know what the purpose of a committee is, don't you? The purpose of a committee, the purpose of having a meeting is not to organize production, but to come up with the reasons why it won't work. That's why we have committee meetings. It's not going to work. We want to hear all the reasons why it's not going to work. And so, disciples are still having meetings today to discuss why it won't work. We know that they had the meeting, and uh, we know that somebody in the meeting asked the question, it's the question the disciples are still asking today. Whenever somebody has an idea about some exciting new outreach venture, somebody is always going to ask this question, how much would it cost? Isn't that right? How many times have you heard that question asked in a church meeting? Well, I've heard it a lot of times. And uh, how much will it cost? You know, the reason we ask the question is because we think it depends on us. That's the only reason you would ever ask that question. We want to know how much we have in our bank account. Can we actually do this with what we have? <laughs> it's so human to do that, isn't it? Because we think in human terms, even though we have been born into the kingdom of God and our, and our, and our home is not in this world, we still think worldly and earthly rather than heavenly. And so we still are asking that question, how much will it cost? You say, well, where did you get that in the story? I've never read that in the Gospels. It's because you have to read between the lines, friends. You have to read the whole story. After the meeting was over, after the committee had adjourned, they went back to Jesus, and this is what they said. Master, it would take eight months of a man's wages to feed this crowd. Friends, you don't get that kind of information without asking the question. You have to ask the question to get that answer. And what they're saying is, it would take eight months of a man's wages to feed this crowd. We don't have it. That's the implication. But they knew Jesus was pretty smart. That he'll be expecting their best, their top-notch performance. So you know what they did? Still thinking humanly. They went looking for available resources in the area. And did they find any? Well, not much. One little boy is all. Little packed lunch that he brought. A few fish, a few barley loaves, enough for him. But they needed to have the evidence. So they brought the little boy, and they put the little boy in front of Jesus. Now, these guys are not thinking expanding the menu, all right? They're thinking the rationale for failure. That's what they're thinking. 